to get ready, which is not always good. Um, <laughs> no, uh, welcome. And you guys have survived day three. Um, and it looks like almost everybody has made it back. So we didn't, I don't think we lost anybody last night. Um, <laughs> so this morning I get to talk about chef and desired state configuration, uh, which is, uh, to me, Chef is the best way to experience desired state configuration. I'm a huge desired state configuration fan. Um, I uh, I like I like the idea so much. I deployed the first version of that into production, uh, the beta versions of it, and uh, got to kick the tires that way. So I got to experience um, I got to experience the pain of building an environment solely on desired state configuration. Now, when I say pain. I mean pain. Um, it, it hurt, but we have pain in any software in any software projects, right? The, I don't I don't think I've had one software deployment where there hasn't been some edge case or rough edge or, or something that we've had to deal with. So don't take that as a knock against desired state configuration. It's but it, it isn't a full platform. It's a platform feature of Windows Server, and so um, what I've come to find is that the best way to experience desired state configuration is through Chef, because Chef rounds out some of those rough edges. So to start out, um, a lot of people that I've talked to over this week, over the past few weeks, have really not, uh, or, or have kind of started out with the question of, you know, well, what is Chef? Um, I, I know it works at DSC. I've heard it a lot. I've seen, I've seen some demos where Chef's mentioned. Uh, but what is Chef? And in the, in the most narrow sense of the term, we're a configuration management client, but where we see ourselves as, as uh, Chef, the, the organization, is that we're an automation platform. And one, one thing I'm not really going to talk too much about today, but I'm just going to mention it now um, it, because it kind of shows our focus is one of the things that we announced earlier this year and is now available for general sale is our delivery platform. Um, and so we take, the, we take the idea of Chef is a way to help automate your environment. Not, not just config management on the server, but going from application and source code all the way out to effective production environments. So. When, we, when I'm talking about Chef, I'm ma in today's context, I'm mainly talking about the configuration management piece, and that's the biggest piece of the Chef ecosystem right now. Show my ignorance, but I, I thought Chef was a, like a Linux thing. But... So Sh Chef grew out of the Linux community. Um, it is based on, it's, it's uh, built m mostly in Ruby, but it is a cross-platform config management uh, tool. And our Windows story has been okay it, uh, up until a, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, and then it started really getting a lot better and, um, and a lot stronger. And we've dedicated a ton of engineering resources um, for the size of our company and effort to, number one, improving, improving the experience on Windows, adding coverage. Uh, when uh, desired state configuration was announced at TechEd uh, a few years back, Chef was one of the first ones to kind of step up and say, hey, yes, we want to integrate with this because we think this is a great idea. We've got our CTO uh, you know, announcing on Twitter, like DSC is uh, one of the most forward thinking things that any operating system vendor has ever done. Um, and so Chef, uh, Chef uh, fully wants to be and does participate in the Windows ecosystem and community. Um, we have a preview of Chef running on Nano Server, and when Nano Server, server ships, we will have a Chef client that will support that. Um, that's one of our that's one of our efforts. This, this uh, engineering efforts this fall is as Nano Server uh, develops, we're building Chef client to support that, and so. Um, so we definitely fully participate in the Windows ecosystem, uh, not just through DSC, but also, but DSC is a, a core component of our forward growth. 
So that kind of leads into, so whenever I refer to Chef now, I'm primarily going to be referring to Chef Client, which is the configuration management portion of Chef. That's what runs on a server and takes it into that desired state. It goes from some unknown state to a desired state. So the first step in a, in a, in a Chef run is you start with a policy, a run list. And that's a list of policies to apply. If we were to translate this into DSC terms, this, is, this would be similar to a uh, series of composite, uh, composite resources that you might apply um, without actually having applied any variation to it. It's, I want you to do these things. Then we have a process that runs called OHI, and that inventories your system state. And this is something that you don't see at all in the DSC space by itself. Um, what this will do is it'll take a look at, at a lot of hardware. It will take a look at software that's installed. It will tell you the PowerShell versions installed, any uh, some other programming languages. It, there's just a ton of information that you get back. And that information is all part of what, uh, what Chef considers the node object. And that's all stuff you can use to make determinations about what about how the policy you've defined, that run list, gets applied to the node. Then we build a resource collection. So all basically these policies define recipes that live in cookbooks. You can think of recipes as a configuration script and cookbooks as PowerShell modules. That, that's kind of rough analogs there. So we build a resource collection. So in desired state configuration terms, that's when we run our configuration script and generate our MOF document. Well, in Chef client land, we do that dynamically on the client. So in desired state configuration, we would have some build process that would generate our MOF documents, stage them out to a poll server, or build process generates some MOF documents and pushes them out to nodes. In, uh, in Chef, you get that top level policy list, and then the client will do that, say, MOF generation kind of in memory, and we call that a resource collection. So we build that resource collection and then apply it. One thing we've recently added is after, after we apply this resource collection, we now have a phase for audit. And one of the things that we've found in working with a lot of our enterprise customers is, as well as, uh, as well as other shops, is there's various uh, audit requirements that we need to satisfy. And one, one of the challenges to working at velocity is ensuring that we meet all of our audit requirements. And so we've added a phase in Chef Client to, vet, to validate audit rules and, uh, and are providing and, and are building out uh, a better way to express those audit uh, those audit uh, rule evaluations in syntax that matters to auditors. So you can, as part of your chef run, not just validate that, hey, I set a registry key, but hey, I disabled remote desktop for this node, and it can run a series of checks and validate that. So every time you apply policy, or you could just run an, an audit check, every time you apply policy, you're validating that you meet all your audit requirements. And so when the auditors show up, instead of, Okay, now we got to run and check all this stuff or write a script to go check all this stuff. It's, here's your report. Thank you. We validate this every 30 minutes in our environment. That's, it, that, that's a powerful story to tell. And then at the end of the Chef run, we inventory the system again. Now, Chef Client does not require a Chef server to run. You can run this kind of... Uh, on, on its own against its own in-memory version of a chef, chef server. But if you are using a chef server, what it does is at the end of the run, it will update the chef server with all of the node data. So all that inventory data plus data about that chef run. So you will have, uh, so as part of your chef run, you will have a whole lot of data about your server's inventory information, things like that. And that's all available to be used by other nodes in their determination of what they do. And I'm, I'm simplifying a few things and I'm skipping over a few things. So I, uh, if I, I, I'm kind of just generalizing this to get the 
general idea of how, uh, how chef, the chef workflow works. Um, if you have more specific questions after this or uh, going forward in the future, I'm more than happy to dive into the more specific details. But that's the general flow of how a chef client run works. So how do DSC and chef work together? And don't worry, I have a bunch of slides, but there is some demo. Um, so how do chef and DSC work together? Well, about a year ago, we introduced DSC script resource. And what that allows you to do, uh, and that works WMF4 and above, and allows you to create a configuration, just like you would in desired state configuration by itself, and embed that inside of your DSC uh, in, embed that inside of your chef recipe. You can either point to an external file that has your configuration function in it or a configuration command in it, or you can embed a snippet of DSC syntax within your recipe and use that. Now, this exposes everything you normally would have in desired state configuration. Composite resources, uh, class-based resources if you're on WMF5 or above. Uh, re traditional resource, all, all the inbox resources as well as traditional resources. Uh, one of the advantages to this is that you have compo composite resources available. So you can take advantage of, of things that other people have already done, some of the things that have been published out, works out very well. Uh, the downside of DSC script is that it's invoking a full Con, uh, DSC configuration run, it, it generates a config document, creates them off, and applies that to the local configuration manager, all as part of the chef run. And if you have multiple DSC script sections embedded in a configuration, that's multiple MOFs being generated, the local configuration manager being, uh, being invoked multiple times. There can be a little bit of a performance penalty with that. Um, so DSC script can be a little slower, but it supports all the way down to WMF4, and it supports all the features of desired state configuration. <coughs> yes? Is that uh, asynchronous? Is the LCM operating on its own? Or does Chef apply new stuff to intercept messaging and intercept reboot, possibly? Yeah, so uh, intercept reboot, no. So one of the patterns that I recommend if you're going to use uh, DSC script in your configurations is that you set the LCM to not allow reboot, which is the default, but you never know what somebody's or what's what's happened on a machine. So you want to make you want to ensure that that is in the state you expect, uh, and it's almost like we have tools to make sure we have things in the state that we expect them. So you know we can use that. Uh, so <laughs> we can use that kind of pattern. Uh, but you also want to make uh, you also want to make sure it's an apply only, <laughs> because if, if the LCM is an apply in monitor mode, which is the default. It means every 15 minutes or half hour or whatever, it's going to wake up and try to check its check whatever the last configuration applied to the node is. And if you've if you've used DSC at all, or or if you you attended uh, uh, was it Mike, yeah Mike's talk yesterday, uh, you know that the LCM can when it's mon in apply and monitor it can be it can get busy and check something and then you can't apply a new configuration to it. Well, that would cause your chef run to error, and that's and no one's happy with that. So, uh, so disabling reboot uh, and, and setting it to apply mode uh, are two things that can definitely help out there. If you're rapidly evolving your configuration, setting debug mode uh, is also a thing that can be very helpful because uh, then you don't, have, you don't bump into some of the caching problems with, with desired state configuration. The next way that we work together is the DSC resource resource. So we, we introduced this towards the beginning of this year. And um, I'll, I'll say my, my typical line about this. DSC resource resource is not a delightful phrase. I, <laughs> um, and I'm, it, it was hard to name. It doesn't roll off the tongue very well. I wish people would pay me every time I had to say it. Um, but no one ever does. Well, I guess I get paid to say this stuff, so uh, I, guess that, I guess that should make me happy. Um, so DSC resource, which we introduced at the beginning of this year, is WMF5 and above. Um, so we're forward thinking. We think we're going to support this. As, we'll ride this horse as long as it takes us. Um, 
In order to use uh, in order to use DSC resource, we take advantage of a commandlet, a new commandlet in WMF5, invoke DSC resource. And as things stand in the production preview today, the LCM, the local configuration manager, must be have a refresh mode of disabled. Uh, and so it basically just turns the LCM into an API that we can call. And invoke DSC resource allows you to individually call the test, set, and get methods under your own control. So with DSC script, we're running that that we're running that DSC script synchronously. We're parsing the verbo we're doing the dash wait and dash verbose. So we're we're getting the verbose output and then we're parsing that to figure out what resources changed, what didn't, so we can accurately reflect what resources changed in your chef run. With invoke DSC resource, we have a much finer grain control. We can individually call test and set methods. We can then and get back a response so we can individually update things. It's also much more performant than creating a whole configuration, applying it to the LCM, letting the LCM go through and do all its stuff to return back results to us. Uh, now, as things stand, and things could change either on Microsoft's side or on ours, as things stand today, you cannot use DSC script and DSC resource on the same machine without changing the LCM state between them. And if you go into if you go into that and you're trying to change the LCM state back and forth, you're embarking on the path to madness. And I will not pay your bar bills if you try to do this. <laughs> so, downside Invoke DSC resource does not know anything about composite, conf, uh, composite resources. So you cannot use those with invoke DSC resource. Don't love that. I, 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 would, I would love that if we could use composite resources via invoke DSC resource, but we cannot. So to quick sum up, benefits, much more performant, gives chef finer control, um, and so it's, it's more accurate. Downside, no composite resources, cannot mix it with DSC script, and it's WMF 5 or above. So that's how we use DSC. So, but I haven't really talked about what Chef brings to the table, and I, and I didn't even think about that phrasing at first. Um, <laughs> but. What, what does Chef bring to the table as far as the DSC side of things goes? So f desired state configuration <coughs> in and of itself is a pretty, pretty uh, from, the, from the idea of going from a, a, a configuration document to applying that configuration, it handles a, a lot of cases and it, handles, it can handle them pretty well. However, there are some rough edges and, and Chef can help with those. The first is responsiveness. When you're working in desired state configuration, the only place that you can do logic about the state of things is inside that resource. So if you need to reason about the current state of the machine, that's the, the only time you can do that is in the resource, if you're doing it from the machine. The typical pattern in desired state configuration is I, I have some single, I have my single source of truth where my configuration script is. I generate configuration documents based on configuration data and my configuration command. And then we stage these MOF documents out to the poll server. That MOF document is the, all of the resources that are going to be applied. But there's no conditional logic inside that MOF document. So Chef allows you to, uh, but because Chef builds that resource collection, actively every time it runs on the client, you can take advantage of things that are happening on that client at that time. Um, you can take a look at what roles and things are applied to it. You can take uh, account of the system state information, like uh, what subnet it's on, or uh, you know, if it needs to make a determination as far as what, what, thing, to, what thing to connect to. Or if, uh, you know, take the example of Hey, we had to run jet stress and now we're going to go run other stuff. We could put a conditional in place that our jet stress test for our exchange servers is only going to happen if 
we've not validated that. And we could set a note attribute saying, hey, this is validated. So we just skip this every single time. It can be part of our one policy. We don't have to do that in a separate phase, but it'll get skipped every time once that state's been validated. Um, This is the one thing, notifications, this is the one thing I have been asking for for two years or so on desired state configuration. This, is, this goes back to kind of responsiveness, but one of the, one of the core concepts in config management uh, is that re resources have the ability to talk to each other or, or pass messages around. And so in, in desired state configuration, again, the only place that we can do logic and determine things <coughs> is inside the resource logic itself. Um, inside of a chef run, I can actually have resources that, that notify or subscribe to each other to run conditionally. So for example, a very basic use case. I have a service, it has a configuration file. When I change that configuration file, I need to restart the service. Doing that in desired state configuration requires a custom resource. I can't reuse the file and service resources in a composite config, for example, to do that. Because I can't conditionally run the service resource in response to the file resource in desired state configuration. In Chef, I could have my file resource or my template resource or my DSC resource that points to a, a DSC file resource. And if that executes, it can go and tell a service, hey, you need to restart. And that service will only restart when the file resource executes. You can also do things kind of inverse, like don't run if, if this, or you can have, tell a resource subscribe to, which is the inverse of notify. So I could say, hey, service, you run your restart when you see this file resource run. So just depending on what syntax kind of fits you better, you can do that. Uh, then we get down to environmental data. This is the what, scaling desired state configuration uh, becomes very, very challenging. Once you get past one particular concept. Um, and, and, and so, Doing a, a trial implementation of desired state configuration is usually pretty doable. It's when you need to scale it out to multiple machine types, for example, or multiple data centers. Once you start introducing more variables into your configuration management platform, it becomes very, very difficult to scale out desired state configuration because there's no tooling around it. You have to build your own. I did this. It took me about six months. And... Um, and every time I talk about how it works, I confuse people. Mm -hmm. I, and this is probably a failing on my part, but it's not a very straightforward uh, concept to understand. And there, there can be some complexities there. If you want to be able to change things at an environmental level or at, at like, let's say, it, you know, using one of my old work environments, we had multiple data centers. We had multiple environments. So I might, have a, I might have a service running, uh, say our logging service, or our, mon our monitoring service. It's running in each data center. Each data center is gonna have its own specific log collection point before it goes back to a central. So uh, if I wanna point servers in each environment to different logging endpoints, I need to have an override level. But what happens when I wanna test a, a particular one, take one node in my environment and point them to an experimental or a test uh, logging collection endpoint. Now I have to, I have to be able to override those settings at a very at a very granular level. I don't want to have to change my configuration script every single time I do that. So I need to have a method to go from my config data, which has no implicit structure other than there needs to be this all nodes array in it to figuring out how I'm going to bring that back down into my 
configuration script. So Chef deals with this through a, uh, through a couple of ways. Uh, we have the concept of roles, environments, and data bags. And these are just buckets that you can put things in. So roles allow you to find run lists for, so you might have like a base server role that has all your common stuff. You might have a web server role that has the, your IIS specific settings. You might have a role designed for an application that's gonna provide that application specific settings. Um, but it gives you a bucket, a specific bucket and place to put that as well as an API of how to use it. Um, environments allow you to specify data that is going to be available to any node that's in that environment. So I could say everything in my dev environment knows what my dev SQL server connection string is. I could say that um, everything in my, maybe I have an environment for AWS and everything that's in AWS is going to get certain information. Everything that's in Azure is going to get other information. Um, the other, like my, I might have Azure Dev and uh, AWS Prod or whatever, but in environments, you can specify data to go down to uh, these things as well. The other benefit that environments provide is the ability to version your, the policies that are going to go out to a node. Um, so in an environment, I can say this cookbook has to be version X, or it can be version X dot whatever. It could be X dot one, X dot two, X dot three. I could put version constraints on a particular environment. So I can say production is always going to have version 1.1.2 in, product, in production. And regardless of what versions I push up to my chef server, I will only get 1.1.2 in my production environment. That means in my dev environment, I might have looser restrictions. I might say anything greater than 1.1.2 can be in dev, or anything less than version 2 can be in dev. And so I can make I can make iter I can iterate and make changes in my dev environment, which will never impact my production environment until I change that production environment to allow that version constraint. Uh, that that is a very that can be a very powerful concept. Then we have data bags. Sometimes you have data that's not particularly associated to a role or an environment, it just doesn't fit into some other category. <coughs> and so these are just kind of general data storage categories. Uh, anybody ever play Dungeons and Dragons? All right, I've got a couple of folks, uh, and everyone else who wouldn't admit it. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in the, in the, the name data bag actually comes from the Dungeons and Dragons game. There's a, uh, there was a, a common item that people, uh, a common magical item that people would come across uh, called a bag of holding, which is a small bag that you could just, it would hold anything you could possibly put into it. And that's the same concept. It's, you have, you just have this structure and it will hold whatever you shove in there. And so, the, and that can be then retrieved by just about any node you want. Um, so you might have pointers <laughs> to particular application versions or uh, this is a, a common place that you'll put encrypted data. So there's a concept of encrypted data bags or there's a product called Chef Vault which helps you get stash encrypted data inside of a data bag that can, that can only be decrypted on the appropriate clients. And then very recently we've introduced the concept of policy files. And policy files are similar to, they're, they're, they're basically like a combination of roles and environments that you can version. And it allows you to um, kind of get some of the best of both worlds. Policy files are pretty new, um, and so I don't have a ton of hands-on experience with them myself, but they seem to address some of the concerns. The fact roles and environments are not versioned, and policy files can be. So, um, so that, that addresses one of the concerns for, for people there. It also acts as a dependency resolution tool. So when you, when you generate your policy, you can find all of the various versions of things that your configuration management depends on. The last thing that uh, I think Chef kind of brings to the table is an ecosystem of tools. And we have testing tools, stuff for dealing with, with cloud API wrappers, uh, dependency resolution tools, um, 
There's a ton of existing cookbooks in our ecosystem of varying levels of quality, just like there's a, a, a selection of DSC resources with varying levels of quality. Uh, the X Exchange stuff, uh, I've heard really good things about. The web administration module, X Web Administration, not so much. Um, you know, and so th there's a variety of uh, uh, there's a variety of quality out there in DSC as well as in the Chef ecosystem. One thing we've done recently at Chef is uh, we did a community survey to find out how cookbook quality and cookbook ease of use impacts the use of Chef. We found out that guess what? That stuff matters, and it matters enough that we've now uh, dedicated we have a dedicated team to work on cookbooks that are out in the open source space, whether they're ours or somebody else's, to help improve quality and ease of use across the board. Um, so we have people who are, whose full-time jobs is to build cookbooks that are open source, that anybody can use, and make them better and improve them. And then uh, our, now everything I've talked about up till now has all been in our open source space. And you get advantage. You can take advantage of it for no dollars down, no dollars per month. And uh, we also have, though, on top of our server. Our server is open source, but we have some premium features on top of Chef Server uh, to enable reporting and analytics. Uh, there's a management dashboard. Gives you some nice views. But these are things that are not just present in the DSC ecosystem. Uh, there is a there is some work on, on, on a reporting roll up and, and, and that kind of thing, um, but they're not to the uh, they're not to the polished level of what exists in other in other tools currently, and so uh, Chef provides a nice reporting and analytics dashboard. Um, the analytics feature also allows you to do things in response to conditions. So say a policy you can do things when you, you can get notifications or log when policy changes on a node. This is another thing for audit and compliance. How often are policies changing on a node? How often do nodes have to actually correct themselves? So you get, you can have, uh, you can have, get a lot of information in that regard. And I tend to think that it's an awesome community. Community is one of the main reasons that I joined chef. Um, because number one, they want to be part of this community. Um, the chef community feels very strongly that Windows, is, uh, Windows and Windows administrators and Windows developers are important parts of our ecosystem and Chef wants to be an active participant there. And not only Chef the company, but Chef the community. And so, um, you know, that, that's one of the main things that drew me to Chef is how they engage community, this, our, this community, the broader Windows sysadmin community, as well as their own community. All right, now let's see what some of this stuff looks like and how it works. So I've got a DSC configuration here that I'm just going to walk through and I'm going to show you a DSC configuration and I'm going to show you the equivalent chef recipes. And we're going to actually go through and run one of them uh, given time, which I think we're doing pretty good on. Uh, before I dive into demo, any questions on all the words I've sent your direction? Yes? Um, just a question. We were talking about setting different variables depending on the environment. Uh, what if you would like to have variables, but it's not based on the environment, such as, you know, for instance, you've got three developer teams that will address different uh, build servers. So mm -hmm. how could I kind of keep the same configuration basically and just change smaller things? Would that be a partial configuration or what would we be? So th there's a couple ways you can approach it. Um, number one would be, because I, I forgot to mention roles also allow you to provide data. So you could have a role as far as like build server team A role build server team B and then they all use the, a build server role and then you just have some additional metadata that you're going to include with it or you could build a, a, a cookbook that has cookbooks can also in addition to policies cookbooks can also contain metadata that uh, like uh, variables that you can pass into your configurations so you could just include a cookbook that's you know developer team A's build settings or developer team B's build settings 
So it will be kind of close to partial configuration, just done in, in a maybe more structural way. No, par partial configurations are the wrong solution to the to to a, to a problem. For for the most part, if you are thinking about using partial configurations, you are probably solving the wrong pro the problem in the wrong place. Partial configurations and desired state configuration. Oh, and, and let me. There's a lot of there's a lot of similar terms here, so let me try to be very very explicit about the words I'm going to use. There are. Composite con composite resources, which are configure are, are are configuration commands that get embedded in another configuration. Partial configurations are a new feature in WMF5, which allow you to ship a configuration section to a node, and then the node will take all of the partials that are sent there and build one big MOF to apply it to the system. Okay, so are, are, are you mainly referring to partial configuration, actual partial configurations, or composite con, uh, composite resources? Um, I'm meaning, I think, the actual, the one that comes with version 5. I okay. haven't really looked into it, so I don't know what it is. Yeah, so, so the, the, the problem with, yeah, the problem with partial configurations is that you are putting all of your potential problem and change detection on the node that it's, that's applying that configuration document. Which means either you have to have a complete uh, you have to have a complete integration environment set up for each environment you're trying to replicate with partials, so that you can test all that stuff together. Or you're going to let things just blow up in production when they when when they go wrong. Um, and the the one scenario that I can really conceive where partial configurations make sense is in a managed services environment where there is a, a complete hard administrative boundary, like one company to another company, and one company is providing like base server configuration and the, the other is providing some application-based configuration. Um, that would be one kind of problem area where it could solve. When you have internally within one organization areas where you have different spheres of influence or control, that that type of stuff should be solved further upstream as part of your build process. Maybe each, each organization or each de department or each team is going to have a separate source control repository, but then your build process needs to pull from all of those, do the change detection early or the conflict detection early, put in whatever workflows and approvals you need at that, you know, in that stage before you deal with problems landing on your server out in production. So if, you, if, if you're thinking about doing partial configurations, think hard about it because it's probably not the way you want to solve the problem. Now, the PowerShell team, my perspective here, I, I can't speak authoritatively for them, but my view of why partial configurations exist is we had this, we, there was a, a need expressed for individual groups to be able to manage different portions of a server. The PowerShell team, their development kind of boundary is the local configuration manager. So they have to solve the problem there. But what we're really dealing with is a departmental politics and process problem that needs to be handled earlier upstream so that you can deal with those conflicts and pain before they get into production and cause fires. Uh, uh, and that, so that's my little partial configuration rant. Um, but where, where we're separating out environmental data, that comes into either into your roles, into your environments, into, into wrapper cookbooks. There, there are ways to solve that without going down the route of partial configurations and waiting for things to blow up further down the road. Um, partial configurations sound great. They sound like, oh, hey, there's this awesome way to, to divvy this stuff up. Um, in practice, there will be, a, there, you could potentially have a very, very, very bad experience. This is one, that's, partial configurations are kind of like running a puppet agent, a chef agent, and desired state configuration all on the same node, and different teams shipping different configurations to them. And you could end up with dueling config management or conflicts, and it, it, it's probably not the route you want to, probably not the route you want to go. All right, any other questions before we move into looking at some code?
All right. So either I'm very, very good at explaining at 10 a.m. that I'm not as good at 9 a.m. doing, or, uh, or, or, it's, or it's actually the third day of this conference and you all are tired, too. Okay. So we are looking at a configuration function or a configuration command. I've got some configuration data. Doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just going to quickly walk through what we're doing. Uh, I have a module that I built for ChefConf that was really, it was X web administration mod or the C web administration module with some tweaks um, because uh, to make a separate binding, uh, a web binding resource. Uh, and I got rid of the X stuff because it's stupid. Uh, X and C stuff, not just X, but um, it, it solved the problem at a point in time. It doesn't, it doesn't need to exist anymore. Um, so based on the nodes, I'm, the node metadata that I'm providing, I'm going to stand up IIS, make sure the web server is running, shut down the default website, and based on information in my config data, I'm going to stand up some websites, some web, uh, web pools and bindings, and throw down, throw down some content in, a, in an index.html for each of those sites. Doesn't, it's not super important what this does, but we just want to look kind of at the structure, how it looks. We got some very, you know, some string interpolation happening. We've got, uh, you know, a number of different resources, and we have some configuration data. So, if I would move this into a Chef cookbook, in my Chef cookbook, this is where uh, this uh, I have an attributes font. I, I have an attributes folder in my cookbook, and in it I can put files that contain metadata. And this is where we put default data that our, our cookbook would use, and that can be overridden by environments, by other cookbooks, by, um, by uh, roles. And there's a whole hierarchy, order of precedence thing, uh, which we don't really need to get into too much uh, at this stage. But here I get to segment out some of my site data. This is the same site data that we had in the... This is basically the equivalent of this hash table here. The site, uh, the sites, uh, or this array of hash tables here, the sites array. And the syntax, it's Ruby, but it looks very similar to PowerShell. I'm indexing into a hash table here. And I have a hash table, and the one big difference, instead of just equals, I have an equals, uh, <coughs> Uh, equals greater than sign uh, or a hash rocket. <laughs> yeah, there's some fun words in the Chef, eco, uh, Chef and Ruby ecosystem. Now, if I were to take that DSC script and convert it to a traditional Chef recipe like we teach in Chef Fundamentals, which isn't a how, the best practice of how to administer a server, but it's more just how to use Chef, it would end up looking something like this, which is really ugly. You got this big block of PowerShell kind of all hunked in here, and it, it's very difficult to follow. It's it's not as nice and clean as looking at to understand what's going on is looking at the DSC configuration. So I can clean it up some with DSC script. So DSC script allows me to take a chunk of desired state configuration and slap it into my chef recipe and things are happy. I can still use my chef metadata to drive new DSC script configuration. This is where, this is where that dynamicism can kind of come in. This is where I have the opportunity to take attributes. I can, I can search against my chef server at runtime so I can inquire about the state of my environment. What are, what's the closest Active Directory server? What other servers are in this are, are in my load balancer pool? What other you know uh, where where are my caching servers? You can be able to drive things dynamically based on how your environment stands at that point in time. Um, becomes very powerful as you move to a more 
um, more cloud-like environment, whether it's in the public cloud somewhere or whether it's in your own internal data centers, you, have to, you, you can start stopping caring about individual things and letting them resolve at runtime, uh, which can be a very powerful technique. String interpolation in Ruby, similar to string interpolation in PowerShell, instead of dollar parens, it's hash braces. Not, not, not a huge difference there from what we saw in the uh, other, uh, from what we saw in the other configuration. And then instead of using the file resource the way I was in my configuration, I just swap in a chef resource because you can use intermix, you can intermix, you can use the best of whatever. There's not a good templating resource inside of DSC, but there's a great templating, templ templating resource in chef. Now that's DSC, how DSC script would look. Let's see how this would look with DSC resource. This is more what a chef recipe looks like without a lot of other syntax slammed in. It's a little more compact, a little easier to read, but this is how I do DSC resource. You can do DSC resource just like my, and so instead of my uh, DSC configuration where I would have Windows feature name and then curly braces, I have my do and my end. And I just have to annotate property. Not, it's a little more verbose than just DSC, but not much. And it's a lot cleaner looking than this. A question? Yes. <clears throat> on the second uh, blob, uh, the service, you don't have a resource name on that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, how do you know it's the service then? Or so in this case, I'm using the chef service oh, you resource. Oh, okay, sorry. Now I see it. Yeah. Yep, and so one of the, uh, and so if I was using the, the if I was going to use the DSC resource one, I could use DSC resource, give it some name, and then resource colon service. Yep. Here, here I'm just mixing in the chef resource, okay. and uh, and you're more than welcome to intermix resources in, inside a chef. So I can use the best of both worlds. I can use if, if the DSC resource is going to accomplish a task better for me, I'm going to use the DSC resource. If the Chef resource is going to do it better, I'm going to use Chef. If my PowerShell skills are better than my Chef, my, my Ruby skills, I'm probably going to lean towards using more DSC resources because when I have to troubleshoot things, I know that world better. When, if I'm a little stronger in Ruby, maybe I'm going to lean towards the Chef recipes and resources more so. Are, are these runs sequential, or are they? Uh, do you have dependencies between, like in DC? Great question. So in desired state configuration, order is not guaranteed between resources. So you have to use depends on, which is a, a, a meta property that everything has, and say, hey, my resource depends on this other thing that happened. In Chef, everything is ordered. So to me, this is uh, this is kind of the principle of least surprise where I declared it first, it's going to happen first. And if it fails, that's where it stops. So um, I, to me, that, to me that, that just kind of intuitively makes sense. And if you want to you know, add some randomization to it, you kind of can. Um, the, so I'm getting the, the wrap up sign here. Um, but yes, so, so everything in Chef is ordered. So the order in which they're declared is the order in which they're going to happen. You don't actually have to implicitly declare, implicitly say depends on. Um, you can inject other things into the order, uh, but you have to work to do that versus working to get a specific order of what you wanted. Um, so this, this then would be the remainder of the recipe. And then here I've noted, so there's this, that notify, notification stuff I mentioned. At the very bottom here, I'm saying, if I update my template, I need you to restart my website or restart my web service. Not necessarily what you have to do, but this is just an example to show that notifies can be used from that and how notifies looks. So unfortunately, I'm about out of time. Um, but if you want to see this actually occurring, there's a video from ChefConf 
where I run this exact same demo um, along with uh, 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 Damien. Um, of course, now on this recording, I'm going to blank on the last name. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Evangelist, uh, Technical Evangelist, um, who uh, he and I did a joint session at ChefCon before we went through this exact demo. And more than happy to sit there, or I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. But thank you guys very much for your time and questions, and uh, enjoy the remaining uh, couple of sessions of the show.